Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. Dr. Evan Katz with Professionally Integrated. Uh, please join us for our amazing webinar that we're doing. We're gonna host it with uh, Dr. Chris Centeno, uh, pain management doctor, and he's also the founder of RegenX, which is a regenerative medicine type of therapy. Uh, tonight's webinar is gonna be on a very complicated issue that we certainly see with our patients, and this is upper cervical instability primarily with the ADP open mouth and a digital motion x-ray with left and right lateral bending. Now, it's important for us to know as doctors that there's significant amount and different types of pathologies that can occur. We certainly see a reversal of the cervical curve or a cervical kyphosis with mid or lower cervical instability, and many times we can manage those, including we can manage them with upper cervical instability. The problem is, what do we do when these patients aren't responding or aren't responding as well with our care with this pathology? The way that I've treated this in my office for approximately the last 12 years has been really trying to restore their normal lordosis and trying to stabilize their cervical spine. However, there's a small percentage of those patients that just aren't responding, mainly with headaches, maybe even slight dizziness, nausea, because of the upper cervical instability, and then where do we go and what can we do for these patients? Well, Dr. Chris Centeno is going to give a webinar on a type of treatment that he has developed. He's the only one in the world that is doing this, where he's taking an injection, uh, mainly of PRP, and he's going through the mouth to hit these ligaments. And I'm gonna let him explain what he's doing in his seminar and then make sure you stick around for the live Q&A that we're gonna do. However, when we're looking at these ligaments, obviously we're looking at the transverse accessory and ALR ligaments and how they affect movement or stability or instability for that matter. What we wanna understand with Professionally Integrated and the doctors are Professionally Integrated is, we'd love to say that we can help all patients all the time, but no doctor can. And what we want to understand is what types of problems are these patients facing so we can apply appropriate treatment methods or co-manage with appropriate referrals. Now, we need to understand that not all chiropractors, not all medical doctors are created equal. Uh, I'm lucky here in Colorado that we have someone like Dr. Centeno where we can refer some of our patients to with these upper cervical instabilities. Before we do another pretty aggressive treatment, which can be necessary in certain cases, which I know Dr. Uh, Joel Frank down in Florida, who I certainly respect, uh, is doing upper cervical fusions, but this could be a step that might help patients before we get to another pretty aggressive type of procedure. So I hope that you really enjoy this uh, uh, webinar that we're going to do. I will certainly show you some examples here of what's happening with these upper cervical instabilities, how we identify them, what is the normal, obviously normal. We don't want to see more than about a two millimeter um, translation uh, in the AP open mouth. And we do know that these types of injuries are common in trauma such as car crashes. And we know that body position, as I mentioned before in some of our other videos, uh, also, uh, if you're a member, you have access to the literature and the discussions on these, that head turned or head rotation during impact can increase the likelihood of these problems from occurring. We also know that some of the pain patterns can be in the back of the head or referral type of symptoms. So we need to understand what these uh, injuries are, how to identify them, and how to ultimately help our patients so we can become better docs. So sit back, relax, enjoy the uh, videos and the webinars, and make sure you're writing down some questions for us that you're going to have after these um, webinars that we can answer live for you. So uh, if uh, you're not a member of Professionally Integrated, join up. It's certainly going to help you help more patients. Thanks so much. Hi, it's Dr. Centeno, and today we're going to talk about can damaged ALR transverse ligaments be healed through a very new and novel injection technique that we've developed. First, I'd like to give some uh, big shout outs and thank yous to Professionally Integrated. Uh, I've known Evan Katz for many, many years, and his dedication to excellence in knowing the science behind why patients hurt is really what I think uh, got us together because I've always had a big interest in traumatic neck injury and 
Evan and I have really connected at that level, and I think he's he's really involved in providing you a great service to bring you the latest and greatest uh, through Professionally Integrated. Second, I'm a huge CBP, uh, CBP fan, chiropractic biophysics. Uh, I've referred many, many patients out through the years to get their curves restored and really believe in that type of care. Uh, so I'd like to put a plug in for that type of care because it's one of the things I've seen through the years help a lot of my patients. And last, just to start this off, who the heck am I? Uh, my background is uh, we were the first physicians in the United States to uh, use stem cells to treat orthopedic conditions in 2005. In fact, there's not even a close second. The next physicians uh, that was using stem cells to treat any kind of orthopedic issues came on in 2009. My background is interventional spine uh, and I have board certifications in PM&R as well as in uh, interventional pain. I've written a lot on a lot of different topics, um, probably about 40 publications now. Most of those are in traumatic neck injury, including uh, a few in the upper cervical spine. Uh, with regard to stem cells, I've published an awful lot. And uh, you see some pictures of our labs off to the right. When I say labs, plural, in Colorado, we have a large clean room processing lab. Uh, we uh, license to a third uh, lab in Grand Cayman where uh, they can uh, grow cells to bigger numbers, something we can't do here in the U.S. And then in Colorado, we have a full university-style research lab where we have all the toys and uh, even more than a university style stem cell research lab. And we do that because we're always interested in staying on the cutting edge. So we've got everything from flow cytometry to fluorescence activated cell sorting to PCR to look at gene expression to uh, multiplex microarray ELISA, uh, fluorescent microscopy, you name it, we got it because we're a true cell biology facility. And we're really the only one in the United States. There's a lot of folks playing in the stem cell world, taking a weekend course, buying a bedside centrifuge, and they're just playing uh, what they've got as a tricycle compared to our Ferrari. Uh, so we're the real deal. Uh, we're also tracking about 4,000 stem cell treated patients in a nonprofit registry right now. Uh, we've been very, very lucky to have the support of billionaire John Malone. And John has uh, helped us in getting a nonprofit funded so that we can do two things. One is we can try to raise the bar in stem cell education because it's awful right now. We've got doctors coming out using stem cells like magic pixie dust, inject, <coughs> excuse me, injecting things that aren't even stem cells at all, uh, who really don't know what they're doing. So one of the goals of the nonprofit is to raise that educational bar, just like professionally integrated. And the other goal of the nonprofit is to track stem cell treated patients so that we can all uh, continue to make sure that this stuff is working and safe. So what's really interesting is, while the topic of today's talk is going to be focused on a very specific upper cervical injection technique, we use stem cells in that technique uh, and we use bone marrow stem cells. So this is, the uh, orthopedic literature going back to 1997. And what I've done here is each one of these little circles that overlaps represents a different research study on the use of bone marrow stem cells in orthopedics. And what I've done here is I've actually uh, gone ahead and uh, put up little icons that tell you if, if the paper was injection based or surgically based. And then I've counted up the ends of all of these papers and the cumulative end since 1997 is 8,207 patients have had their results published in the peer-reviewed literature for orthopedic stem cell use. So there's a lot more information out there than people believe. And we're proud to say that 51% of those patients based on the cumulative end of patient results published 
our hour of patience. So we've published more than half of the world's literature uh, with regard to the number of patients that's out there. So let's now switch gears into CCJ, which is really the focus of what we're talking about today. Stem cells are a tool, but really the, the CCJ and how we get to it is really where the rubber meets the road. So one of the problems in CCJ uh, therapy right now is that you've got conservative care, which is quite good. You've got atlas orthogonal work, curve restoration, uh, different types of chiropractic. There's a few rehab techniques. There's a few uh, other manual manipulative techniques that are used. And then on the other end of that spectrum, you've got surgical fusion, this incredibly aggressive uh, high risk procedure. And there's very, very little in between those two extremes. Now, there are some folks that are doing some interventional care, meaning some injection-based care. So let's look at what that is. So what's injected into this area now? And believe me, we've done it all through the years. And it's been that frustration with how poorly the traditional care works in this area that's led, it to the, led us to this brand new technique that, that Evan at Professionally Integrated is giving you a chance to hear about today. So. Uh, the upper cervical facets, facets can be injected. Uh, usually what's injected is corticosteroids. Obviously that hurts the joint. Uh, sometimes you'll see some PRP being injected more recently. The big issue with injecting these facet joints is that there are really few physicians with high levels of experience here. So uh, my partner and I, John Schultz, have done about a thousand uh, at each level each. So that would make us the most uh, prolific upper cervical uh, injectors in the U.S., meaning uh, you know, a physician with a high level of experience at C0-C1, for instance, since it's a difficult joint to inject, may have only injected uh, 100. Uh, so uh, we've done a lot of this work because we've seen a lot of these patients. And the good news is that some of these patients will fall out here. If you put some PRP into their C0, C1 facet, they do better um, and that seems to manage them. You know, maybe they get that done once a year or two. Um, you, you can also do traditional prolotherapy type techniques, uh, which are usually blind. So prolotherapy, if you don't know, is injecting a substance to cause a brief inflammatory healing reaction in the ligament. Uh, and for other cervical instability issues, it can be quite a powerful technique. Uh, we published on a prolo technique uh, many, many years ago where we actually were able to show reduction in flexion translation uh, with a blinded uh, reader on, on stress flexion extension x-rays after prolotherapy. So that's something that uh, works. The biggest problem is it's usually not done under guidance. We do all of ours under guidance. And this is a tough area to inject without guidance because there's important stuff like the vertebral artery you don't want to hit. So some of the patients with a CCJ instability will get some benefit from that. But again, usually it's not a home run with these patients. It's more the lower cervical instability patients. Then you've got upper cervical tendon attachments. The skull base can be injected either with prolotherapy or corticosteroids or PRP. Not a big corticosteroid fan, so we don't do that. Uh, you can go ahead and block the greater occipital nerve and lesser occipital nerve and try to reduce some of the headache pain due to irritation of those nerves. Obviously, as you know, there's also a myodural bridge up here. And there really are no medial branches in the upper cervical spine. The highest is C2. So there's really no way to radiofrequency ablate this area. Now we used to do a lot of radiofrequency ablation in the day. We've now replaced it with regenerative medicine, PRP and stem cells in our practice long since. Um, but even if you could RF this area or you wanted to, there's really no way to do it. Uh, and there's some physicians who are doing pulsed or, or cool thermal radiofrequency of the C1 and C2 dorsal root ganglia. And that could be somewhat effective. Again, the problem is you're kind of just doing a little bit of damage to the nerve uh, to try to see if you can help these patients, which is going to screw up proprioception, etc. So the two most talked about and least accessed ligaments in the world have to be the alar and transverse, meaning that um, 
uh, it comes as a surprise to uh, many chiropractors I lecture to on this topic that not a single human being in the in the history of the earth uh, has ever injected the alar or transverse ligament directly. Um, many uh, chiropractors have been sending their patients to a prolotherapist who claims to inject these ligaments. They're not getting to these ligaments. They're coming from the back. Uh, the spinal cord, regrettably, is in the way. Um, so there's no way to get at these ligaments. They're, what, what are they injecting? They're injecting supraspinous ligaments, interspinous ligaments. Somet sometimes, if they do it precisely under guidance, they may be able to hit the uh, lano-occipital ligaments laterally off of the uh, uh, transverse process of the atlas. But bottom line is, uh, these are often talked about, but no one is hitting these ligaments. So what do these ligaments do? They keep the dens from hitting the cord and cervical flexion. That's the transverse ligament. They control C1, C2 motion and rotation and lateral bending. That's the ALAR. And rotation and flexion stresses the ALAR ligament the most. The kinetic anatomy of the CCJ on the ALAR side is the ALARs limit rotation and lateral flexion uh, when they're both tight. But what's really probably the most interesting thing about the ALARs is the contralateral ALAR is tight with a head turn, the ipsilateral is lax. So it's kind of an opposite type mechanism. And the kinetic anatomy of the transverse ligament really is a bit simpler to understand. Uh, it acts as almost like the seat belt for the dens and it's there to prevent that dens from moving into the spinal cord uh, in flexion. It also serves as a major pivot point as you turn your head. So what causes laxity and what do patients complain of? Well, the biggest thing we see consistently is trauma to the head usually in a motor vehicle collision, but sometimes it could be that something fell on the head. We've seen that. One guy had a speaker at a bar fall on his head. Um, and also motor vehicle collisions. Many times they're hitting their head on something in the motor vehicle collisions. Uh, that could be on the B pillar. That could be uh, on the uh, back of a pickup truck window. And they have headaches, dizziness, visual disturbances, cognitive issues. Everything gets worse with activity. Physical therapy usually makes it much worse. Looking down makes it worse with or without rotation. So the typical patient for this kind of advanced procedure we're going to talk about today is that we're hit on the head, head trauma, whiplash, severe headaches that usually can't be remediated uh, or they can be with a specific manipulation, usually an upper cervical manipulation, but it's temporary. It then comes back. And they have other associated symptoms that can really vary depending on the severity of the instability. Uh, mild with uh, things like dizziness, cognitive, visual, to severe, which can even be numbness and tingling in the leg. We had one woman we treated with this procedure who, who didn't have any more numbness and tingling in her leg. So go figure. Uh, again, physical therapy generally makes them worse. And... Uh, all existing interventional care kind of only helps a little bit. Everything that we talked about, you can inject in the cervical spine, only really helps them just a bit. So can we image these ligaments? The three biggest ways they're being imaged uh, are DMX, rotatory CT, and upper cervical MRI with a head coil. And open your mouth. That's so perfect. DMX, as right, you all right know, shoulder. is pretty cool. Perfect. Uh, you can actually go ahead and, and image through an open right mouth view, and you, you can see here some left instability, left some lateral overhang happening as, as this person uh, is so able to uh, bend their head, and we're right able to there. image Perfect. that. Okay, hold so quite center. a bit of ALR type and laxity happening here, left, really bilaterally, in this patient. Rotatory CT was used in the 90s in Europe, and the concept there was the patient went into a CT scan, turned his head. You then measured against the neutral position uh, how much rotation was happening at uh, the skull base at C0 and C2. And there was a study done that seemed to show that the biggest issue in chronic whiplash patients was that about a third of them had uh, excessive rotation at C0, C1. 
And it was more oftenly, uh, often that you would find this at C0C1 than C1C2. Now, MRI imaging has been really interesting in this area. Um, you know, I know Scott Rosa does some excellent work up in uh, New York with these, and Dave Harshfield has been working with Scott on really perfecting this technique. Uh, now, in the peer-reviewed literature, there's been an interesting kind of um, ping-pong game going on. The original papers were by Crokinus. Uh, we actually flew Crokinus out to Denver about 10 years ago for him to give a lecture uh, when he first published some of these papers. And the data looked really good uh, for changes in signal in these ligaments, alar transverse, as well as the tectorial membrane and the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane, uh, which we can now also uh, inject. The problem was that in the initial papers, these patients came from a highly select background. They were basically patients of a manual physical therapist in rural Norway who had collected these people over time. So uh, Karakinus imaged them and found a very high level or a high amount of signal abnormalities in these patients as compared to normal controls. However, uh, I got to know Crocodus a little bit, and he was under tremendous pressure by local insurance-connected radiologists, uh, and he then published this paper that seemed to kind of debunk his own theory. The problem with the paper that he eventually published was it took patients out of the emergency room who had complained of some neck pain. As you know, if you take patients out of the ER who complain of some neck pain, only a small percentage of those will go chronic. And only a small percentage of those would be expected to have this kind of problem. So as you might imagine, you would need a huge N to find any patients out of the ER with an upper cervical instability after a car crash. And they didn't see much in the way of signal changes in that population versus normal controls. As you can see here, there's a problem in research called selection bias. So uh, basically the first study that he did with the physical therapist had selected and concentrated these patients from a several country region around Norway. And obviously the patients coming to the ER with little neck pain would, would be expected to have a very low prevalence of any issues that he could detect on MRI. So he seems to have published this paper more to chill out the local radiologist than anything else. So can we access these ligaments? You know, this has really troubled me for a long time because I've treated literally a thousand upper cervical injury patients. They're very common in our practice. We as well have kind of served as a, uh, a concentrator for these patients because people got the sense that, that we knew what we were doing with them and we could inject the upper cervical spine when most interventional physicians really had very little experience doing that at C0, C1, and C1, 2 So, uh, the problem was we could never get to these ligaments. So I had, you know, about two years ago, this eureka moment where I said, huh, I think I found a way I can get there. The problem is it's from the front, not the back. So bottom line is, uh, if you look at this MRI uh, and you recognize that the ligaments, uh, if you try to come from the back, the spinal cord is in the way. If you come from the front, the spinal cord isn't in the way, as long as you can get the tongue out of the way, you can go through the back of the throat or the posterior oropharynx. Now, initially, when I first looked at that, I said, wow, that's pretty nuts, uh, trying to inject through the back of the throat. Having said that, our dental colleagues obviously inject uh, throughout the mouth and throat area with no issues. ENT physicians do it. You've got gynecologists injecting through vaginal tissue. So there's significant precedence for injecting through uh, the oral mucosa. So we finally, uh, after actually 3D printing some devices initially, we uh, finally found a device uh, used for opening the mouth and depressing the tongue. That, uh, and this is what we utilize. It's normally used uh, in GI settings for uh, endoscopy. And I spent about a year going back and forth with colleagues before I did my first case with this approach because I wanted to make sure that I had looked at everything. So the good news is there's really very little in the way 
in the back of the throat of where we want to be for these injections. Um, and, you know, the good news is my colleagues all supported that. You know, when they looked at the anatomy, they agreed. So this is the superior view, the top-down view of the injection trajectory that we use. So again, if we were to try to come in from the back here, the spinal cord's in the way. So we come in from the front. And uh, those are the two different trajectories that we sort of use to get to the different ligaments uh, as seen from the side. And what we're really doing is exploiting what's called an articular gap, or at least what I'm calling an articular gap. And that means from the front, which is what you're looking at here, there's a small hole between C1 and C2. And that small hole is a little gap that you can actually get a needle through. Uh, so uh, the first time we did this, we didn't even know if this was a figment of uh, the imagination of the people drawing the pictures or making the models or it was real. And it turns out it's quite real. Uh, and that's just another view. So I'm going to show you how this is done. Um, I have to tell you, though, please, please, this is a very promising technique that I've seen starting to change lives of patients I've never been able to help. So don't screw it up by trying to find some schlock injectionist to see if he can do this. There are only about 100 to 200 physicians in the United States with the interventional experience to pull this off. That, mean it, that means that they have extensive upper cervical injection experience. They've done more than 100 C0, C1 injections in their career. Uh, so again, don't find some schlock injectionist from down the street to try this and give someone a spinal cord injury. And then what will happen is that this wonderful, promising procedure will then be removed from the lexicon for everybody, and these patients won't get care. Um, Again, this is a fluoro-only procedure. It cannot be done safely under ultrasound because you have to see where the needle is relative to the spinal cord. And uh, again, we have some nurse or, or some naturopaths doing some interventional procedures. Not appropriate for this one because the patient has got to be sleeping. Uh, they've got to be put out stone cold and you've got to be able to obviously manage an airway if there's any issues. So the pre-procedure workup for this is, uh, uh, I really want to make sure that everything else has been ruled out that can be done to these patients that's a lower risk, easier procedure. So uh, I wanna make sure that the patients have had upper cervical facets ruled out as a primary cause of pain. Uh, if they can't get those upper cervical facet injections done locally, we can do them here. Uh, obviously they failed rehab and your excellent chiropractic care uh, they continue with disabling symptoms. The posterior upper cervical prolo uh, or PRP injections in the ligaments, again, under guidance in the upper cervical spine. Please do not let anyone inject the upper neck without guidance. Uh, that, in, that, in this case, it's, uh, it's mostly fluoroscopy, but you could do it from the back with ultrasound. Uh, and they have a positive DMX, which is lateral overhang of C1-C2, uh, more than a millimeter or two with lateral bending and or they have an up, abnormal upper cervical MRI, and if that's indeterminate, then obviously the DMX. I'd really prefer the DMX and the uh, MRI if possible. So uh, this is a total IV axis anesthesia only procedure. We also add in an anticholinergic agent to reduce secretions in the posterior oropharynx, and IV antibiotics are used to reduce infection risk. Uh, so very important to control secretions with this. I've been in a situation at least once where the anesthesiologist we used didn't understand how to do that, and it made this procedure much more technically difficult. So this is what it looks like. This is actually uh, in our office. In our office, we have four uh, procedural suites, uh, all with ultrasound and three with uh, serum fluoroscopy. So this is actually me uh, placing the needle you can see the little uh, mouthpiece that we use. Uh, the needle is a four inch, uh, 25 gauge, so very, very thin needle uh, being placed under, uh, uh, under active uh, fluoroscopy. 
and we use a flexible endoscopic uh, imaging device to see where we're going. Uh, this one goes, goes through the math. We're actually now changing that out to a uh, one that'll go through the, uh, the nose, uh, looking at the back of the throat, which I think will give us a better view of where we want to get to. Because really where you're injecting is, is past the tongue. So sometimes it's difficult to image the exact site that you're seeing, even with a little uh, flexible endoscope. And uh, you can see here the needle coming off on the left, injecting the alar transverse complex, uh, the little endoscope there off on the right. Uh, so this is an open mouth type view. And uh, this is what you don't want to do. It's possible to inject the C1-C2 joint, pick up a little bit of the capsule if you go too far laterally. And uh, uh, it's fine if you do that, it's no big deal. Um, but it's obviously not where you're trying to get. You're trying to get in the ligaments, not uh, into the joint. Uh, this is uh, a contrast uh, flow uh, of the alar ligament on the left. You can see here, I've kind of outlined it with the yellow triangles. You can see the AP and lateral view. On the lateral view, you can see the alar ligament. It looks like a little shadow. And you might have a hard time seeing this if you don't look at upper cervical imaging all day, because upper cervical imaging can be very, very challenging. There's a lot of overlapping shadows, uh, but we have here a very nice look at the alar ligament going up to the occipital condyle. We first put in the contrast dye to make sure that we're in the ligament, and then we'll follow that with the stem cells. This is the transverse ligament, uh, which is uh, right in front of, or I'm sorry, change that, strike that, reverse it, right in back of the dens uh, and in the front part of the uh, just in front of the spinal cord. So uh, of the first 10 patients we did, uh, I recently uh, two weeks ago kind of pulled this together. So this is uh, actually, I'm sorry, 10 procedures in seven patients and five of the seven really had life changing results. Um, and what's interesting is that many of these patients are patients I've treated for many years uh, and they you know, we would get a little bit here and a little bit there, but no dramatic results. So everything from decrease in headaches, decrease in brain fog, uh, marked increased activity levels. One lady went back to cross country skiing. Another lady went back to uh, backpacking, multi-mile backpack trips. Um, to uh, other things like, you know, feeling straighter, et cetera. Uh, we had two patients that had no change. Um, but one patient, uh, RL there, um, really had not undergone an interventional workup to see if his upper cervical facets, uh, he was coming, were causing pain. He was coming from Canada. That generally wasn't done up there. So once we did that after the procedure, we recognized that most of his pain was really coming from C1, C2. So he wasn't going to get much relief by stabilizing the ALARs, at least until we treated that damaged joint. Uh, and then uh, EM here, we did not get a good injection on. Uh, and he was the gentleman that had too much secretion. So it was a very difficult technical injection. Uh, and we may bring him back to do this again, because I, I can't say that we got a great injection in him. We were also in the process of really just learning how to do this. And it's not easy. It took you know, really seven, eight injections to really say we're doing this right. We really feel like we got this down. So in summary, injecting the ALR transverse ligaments can be performed. Uh, the procedure appears to be safe, but we're taking it slowly. The results are really promising and kids, please don't try this at home. Uh, I don't want to, I don't, don't want to, uh, uh, I, I don't want to disparage anybody but this is a, a very technically difficult procedure and it should not be done by anyone who doesn't have extensive upper cervical injection experience under C-arm fluoroscopy with dye confirmation. So thank you so much for uh, listening. We're gonna take some questions now uh, and I'll be with Evan uh, to do that. Uh, so we'll move on to the uh, question phase of all this. Team heard. So thanks so much uh, for having us here um, and joining us with Professionally Integrated. As I mentioned, we have, as part of our practice, uh, basically a full-on university-style research lab where we test a lot of different things. And one of the things that we tested a number of years back was uh, the concept of amniotic stem cells. We had 
people coming to us saying uh, there are placental stem cells in this vial, there are amniotic stem cells in this vial. Let's, uh, you know, we'd like to sell these to you. There's a million in this vial, there's two million in that vial. So we said, great, let's test it. So we actually uh, ran those tests. And regrettably, not only are there no amniotic or placental stem cells in any of these things being sold, there's no living tissue at all. Uh, most of these products are gamma terminally sterilized, so that means that they're killed off on purpose before they leave the uh, procurement facility. So again, there really is no such thing right now as amniotic or placental stem cells. There are certainly growth factors in the little vials of amniotic fluid or amniotic membrane that they're selling, but it's not a stem cell type product. Okay. So, okay. Is there any research that shows that more than two millimeters is a sign of ALR instability? Um, so, well, there is, Dr. Centeno is saying no, there is some from, um, and I do have it on my site listed as showing uh, how much movement should occur, and I think it's actually by Punjabi, and I think Punjabi did come up with about two millimeters. But here's one of the things that we've done in our office with instability is, whether it be upper cervical or mid cervical, is we have the AMA guidelines, we have the radiology text that say maybe two millimeters for upper cervical or flexion extension of three and a half or 11. And that could be a problem. But what we like to do is look to see is that area also symptomatic at this point um, and to look. So we've had patients that have upper cervical problems and the measurements may be symmetric or asymmetric or two millimeters or over two millimeters. But if they're super symptomatic, the measurement is important, but maybe not be as much as the symptomatic aspect, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, we look at the whole clinical picture. So DMX is thrown in there, upper cervical MRI, uh, block results, i.e. if we block the C0, C1 facet joint or C12 facet joint, um, their response to other treatments, their physical exam. Uh, many times they've seen an atlas orthogonal um, chiropractor and can get temporary relief or they've seen a chiropractor and get very, very temporary relief. You know, all of those things are put into this mix. I, I don't think there's any one definitive to say uh, this particular test says you should go that way. Right. Or it is fully stable or unstable. And I think other aspects are associated with that too is just looking at lateral stability or if there's a loss of curve with increased extension at the skull, does that increase pressure on the upper cervical ligaments that might not appear in the ADP open mouth, lateral bending view on the DMX. So again, as Dr. Centeno said, is looking at that full clinical picture. And then, you know, I've been lucky and learned a, a lot from Dr. Centeno is, you know, sometimes other forms of diagnostics to see if that joint is a source of pain is also extremely important and may correlate with either the findings or the lack thereof of findings um, on just measurement of two millimeters or four millimeters or three millimeters. Um, and then uh, you did tell, okay. The percentage, you know, uh, percentage, percentage of ALR instability in the general population. It's pretty um, small, yeah. I mean, you know, that, that's actually kind of already been ans answered through some of the Crokinus papers. So the Crokinus story is, is interesting. Uh, as some of you may know, um, uh, Crokinus is a Norwegian radiologist. I talked about him a little bit in the lecture, and he's a neuroradiologist. We actually had him out here a number of years ago, and so I got a chance to see his story. And bottom line is, when he did his initial research on MRI of the ALR ligaments, he was getting referrals from a highly specialized manual physical therapist in uh, Norway who had served as kind of a regional collector of these patients. So highly, highly um, select group of patients that were sent his way for these studies. And he compared those against normals. Later on, when he published additional research, he tried to do the same thing in the emergency room. And these were just whiplash patients walking through. And as you might imagine, the number of people who've been in a car accident who report neck pain immediately, uh, a certain percentage of those will never have neck pain, usually a large percentage of them. Only a small percentage of those will go chronic. Only a small percentage of those will have a serious upper cervical injury. Only a small percentage of those will have this kind of problem. So by the time he looked at that group, uh, there were no differences between whiplash patients walking through the door with some neck pain in the ER and the general population. 
So it's, it's probably very low in the general population. Uh, now there may be certain types of pathologies that, that lend itself to this. Um, uh, scoliosis, for instance, putting much more pressure on one side than the other, uh, those sorts of things. But in the general population, without pain or deformity, it's probably pretty low. Any questions from Chris? Uh, I think he, I think, Absolutely. so someone mentioned about, can you touch on the different yeah. kinds of stem cells? Going to bed, but. Yeah, I can certainly go through that as well. So uh, on the stem cell side, uh, and let me just give you some background. We started doing stem cell work in 2005 in orthopedics. We were the only physicians in the U.S. doing this work at that point. It wasn't until 2009 that another doctor even came on offering this kind of stuff. But it's really exploded in the last year or so. And we see fat stem cells out there. We see bone marrow derived stem cells. And those are really the two primary sources that are being used right now. Regrettably, fat stem cells, if you process them correctly, the F our FDA has declared that a drug. So there's lots of docs that are floating that risk. I just tell them to put a couple hundred grand away in the bank for a, a rainy day fund for your legal defense. Um, and then you've got bone marrow stem cells, which right now, if they're processed the same day, are, are still considered a medical procedure. Space in this area is a little nutty. So we have bone marrow stem cells, fat stem cells are really 95% of what's done in the U.S. right now. Okay. Other, can you refresh that? Okay. So if there's any other questions, type them now because it's already... You know, we don't want to hold you all up. And as you mentioned, these videos, especially for the members, I know there was almost it was almost full capacity with the amount of people that were on here. It's going to be up on the website in the next day or two. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the next day or two, where you can access it and watch the whole thing over again. Um, and they, again, part of the service of professionally integrated. If you have questions, just to call and ask. Um, I hope this was super extremely beneficial. I hope when you get in the office tomorrow, you're gonna to look at these things, understand a little bit more of what can be happening with patients. And it's certainly those patients that we see where we're really trying to restore the mechanics and the curve, and they're still having these upper cervical problems where they're not getting better with what we have, then uh, understand the Dr. Centeno here has developed something, it's incredibly cutting edge. And it is that step before fusion surgeries that they may get from another provider. Um, oh, so someone says, is this injection a one-time deal or could it be performed in a series? Yeah, uh, we have done some of these in a series. So uh, having said that, some of that is related to the fact that we're getting better and better at doing this procedure each time we do it, meaning that when we first started, we didn't even know if we could get through that articular gap or if that was a figment of the imagination of the anatomist who drew the pictures. Uh, we then uh, figured out how to place the needle where the needle needed to be to be able to get the best flow. Um, so because of that, we've had to repeat some. I suspect that um, you know, as this continues on, uh, most patients will probably be a one and done. Some will probably need two. Uh, that would be my best estimate as to how this will go uh, once the procedure is at that point where we've done 100, not just 10. And to follow up on that, I have had uh, the pleasure of treating a lot of these patients that we were treating, they were doing well with certain areas of the neck, but they were still having the upper cervical. And then uh, Dr. Centeno does his procedure, and then we still see them afterwards for some of the rehab and other chiropractic. And a lot of them, you know, did one, maybe two, but they did, you know, a lot of them did pretty well in terms of their upper cervical symptoms. And then my goal or the goal with professionally integrated, obviously, is we want to continue to give them treatment that's going to help them for the long term and really follow what the, our clinical impression is, our clinical experience, as well as the science. So, you know, if they're still having these problems down the road, then, yeah, they, they may get another one. Um, what's the cost of the procedure? Cost? What's the average cost of a procedure? Yeah, so these procedures are running around 4000 U.S. currently. Uh, Unlike some of the other procedures we do, we don't uh, we don't do a series. We just do one of these, and then we'll wait about a uh, good three to six months to see where they are. Most studies on stem cell based ligament healing show that you really got to wait about three months before you even uh, can understand what the outcome is. Okay. Let's see. There's one more question. Or there's a few more questions. 
Um, if there was a joint instability in mid or upper cervical spine, regardless of symptoms, what are some of the potential problems with long-term spinal health? <clears throat> so I'm not going to call you out, but you know this, um, Doc. But uh, so obviously we're looking at the instability. There's a lot of studies that I put up on the site um, with loss of the curve, which is considered from uh, my Punjabi is unstable. But again, you're just wearing and tearing the joint down more and other areas are gonna have to come in to help stabilize. So looking at that joint, if it's unstable, and this is how I really approach it, as I mentioned to a lot of you is, there are certain things that happen in the spine that are a problem. There are bigger problems if they're symptomatic to the patient. And the same thing in healthcare. If you go into your uh, cardiologist and you have high blood pressure, they're gonna do something about the high blood pressure because the likelihood of it becoming symptomatic is greater. And the same is true what we've seen in the spine and what the literature has shown and the same thing that we see here where patients have a loss of curve or instability and they choose not to do anything and then they come back and we do another x-ray and there's more degenerative change in that area. Would you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean instability I mean, over time <laughs> equals degenerative joint disease um, or in the spine, degenerative disc disease and degenerative joint disease. Um, ligament and flavum hypertrophy, all of those things. And, and, and even going back to the 1970s, uh, seminal text, White and Punjabi, that's, that's how they conceptualized it in 1978. It hasn't changed much since then. Um, so another question that missed the beginning of the webinar. So when is the procedure usually done bilaterally or unilaterally? Uh, he has a, they have a patient with significant instability bilaterally versus others that are unilaterally. Yeah. So. We'll generally go bilateral, uh, meaning through both articular gaps, primarily because this is a really small space. We want we want to try to cover everything we can. So as you know, get that model. Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah, you've got the as you know, you got the alar ligament, you got the transverse ligament, you got the uh, accessory ligaments, you've got the uh, uh, the dental or the uh, atlantodental. So, long story short is, uh, coming through these articular gaps, they're, they're not that far apart. So it's relatively easy if we're doing this one to do that one. We also want to make sure we get as good a flow as we can, and, and sometimes that's just being off by a millimeter here or there, a millimeter high, a millimeter low, a millimeter medial, a millimeter lateral. So we try to get as much flow in that area and as many ligament structures as we can. Uh, so we'll usually treat both sides. Okay. okay, well, hopefully that answered all your questions. Again, if you have any uh, questions or comments, uh, get in touch with me through Professionally Integrated. Um, if you have questions or uh, comments, you can certainly contact Dr. Centeno in his office at wherever would be the best uh, place to... Yeah, the best thing to do would probably send me an email. My The email that goes to my desk is Centeno Office, so C-E-N-T-E-N-O office, two O's, Centeno office at Centeno Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-T-Z dot com. So Centeno office at Centeno Schultz dot com is the one that goes to my desk. And just email me. That's usually what I'll, I'll do. And then I'll throw it to staff um, to try to get some more information if we need more information. Just recognize that we want these folks to have gone through some of the prior steps and some of the things that are less invasive than this, hopefully we'll get to that point over the next year or so where we can say, oh, just skip A, B, and C and go to, go to D. But right now we're trying to do it in a very methodical way. And again, uh, that's one of the great things with Dr. Centeno is he definitely thinks outside the box um, and understands other types of treatments and hopefully you guys have patients that could use his care, or maybe there's even a provider like him near you, which I haven't met one yet. But uh, anyway, um, thanks for uh, tuning in. I hope that uh, some of the questions you asked about the instability long term or the uh, how much instability or what is the guidelines for stability, you check in on the website. A lot of that research is there for you. Um, if it's not, I will put it up there and I'll find it. Uh, and thanks so much for joining in and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon as we'll be doing more webinars with more people and continue to put more uh, research up there. And for you members, uh, make sure you go onto the site tonight um, and even the ones that aren't members that logged in, we're going to be sending you a really cool paper with ligaments and um, their properties and other things. So you'll get that uh, in your email coming up here soon. So thanks so much. <laughs>